The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. Now, I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. David, today we're in the Bahamas with Richard Ron, and of course last year we interviewed him as well. He had a great interview last year. We had a lot of comments. Again, Richard Ron is a man who's motivated highly by the political changes you know, in the country all through his life. After the Carter years, he went to work for Reagan, and then after that, the first George Bush. So uh, what do you think he brings to the table this year? Well, he regularly comments for the Cato Institute, and you'll find his columns with some frequency in the Wall Street Journal. And what we want to do is just have sort of a a D.C. perspective, if you will. Some of the things that are changing policy-related that do have a direct impact into the financial markets. And, you know, we can have our opinions, but to be quite honest with you, Durango is a long way from the Beltway. Well, and Richard, I have to tell you, it's one of those things. David, we went to New York to do the video a couple of years ago, and then we went on over to uh, Washington, D.C., and I'm telling you what, it was like going into a bubble, like a completely different world. You, you couldn't feel the economic downturn. You couldn't feel, actually, you couldn't feel any kind of consistent consciousness. Yeah, and Kevin, that was a few years ago, and the, the point was we saw a transformation taking place. The power center, which had been New York City, right. was the baton being passed, if you will, to D.C., passed or taken, as it were. And D.C. now is in a, in a, in a very strong position, Washington, D.C., to control outcomes within the capitalist system. There are challenges to the capitalist system which we will have to see if that system in fact survives the pressures. I believe it will. Kevin, the challenge to capitalism is now the state is challenging basically the corporate structures which has become dominant over the last 30 or 40 years with finance becoming more and more important as we go. Well, with finance being a part of that, we want to look at how individuals are navigating this. Last year, with our conversation with you, Richard, we talked about FATCA. FATCA is legislation that's already been passed and will be implemented in 2013. Which, well, of course, you're talking about the Foreign Accounts Compliance Act. That's a, exactly, and this is what is is ultimately limiting in terms of an American's ability to have assets anywhere else in the world. And it's strange because, well, it's not important to most people. It is strange to be told you have to keep your money inside these walls. When you're handcuffed, you realize that you're restricted. Without the handcuffs, there was no issue. Well, David, it used to be when we talked about government regulation here in America, we talked about government regulation here in America. But what's happening is FATCA is America going outside and regulating everything outside of its borders as well. And so, this, Foreign this banks is- and financial institutions having to comply with U.S. legislation and being held liable if they don't. Kevin, it's not so much the issue of people having an account overseas is that they can't have an account overseas. And that, that's the real issue. You are free to live your life as you choose, as an American. Land of the free and home of the brave. No, not outside our borders is the edict coming through FATCA. Richard, Ron, this is the second year we've had the opportunity to sit down and visit. Bahamas is a good place to reflect back on the U.S. and, you know, from an outside perspective, be thinking about not only domestic policy but foreign policy. Something that we covered last year in our conversation was FATCA. The legislation is pending, so to say. It won't be an issue until 2013, but are things getting better or worse? Are they revising it in our favor? What do you see happening with FATCA and legislation like that? Well, of course, the legislation was passed, and what they're working on is the implementing rules. And Treasury has a huge amount of discretion of how uh, the Foreign Accounts Transactions Compliance Act, FATCA, is actually uh, implemented. The problem is, They keep trying to make it broader and broader and bring in more and more financial institutions, not just banks, it's any foreign financial institution. And then they also get hobbled with huge definitional problems. And last week I was talking to one of the attorneys involved and he said it's now up to about 350 pages. And his judgment was it's getting worse and he's one of the people who's got day-to-day involvement with it. The administration keeps saying, well, they're trying to make it easier to comply with. 
but of course these things get bigger and bigger and when you have regulations that go on hundreds of pages nobody understands what it is and we've seen things like this happen in the past and finally they just often almost die of their own weight the whole notion is stupid to begin with it's destructive because it drives capital out of the united states we would be appalled if foreign countries tried to do things like that to us and it makes it almost impossible for americans abroad to get bank accounts and um, so foreign banks and other institutions increasingly are just not going to accept any u.s clients or even invest in the u.s and this could cause us as much as one trillion dollars in lost foreign investment and of course that means a huge reduction in the number of jobs created in the united states the kind of uh, capital we need for r and d and just for economic growth it's washington insanity at its worst well would a change in elections this next year from one party to the next would it improve anything or is, <coughs> is the die cast concerned? it could improve things I think there is some increased pressure just for repeal, particularly the Americans abroad have been very vocal on it. And I would expect a Republican Treasury to be less intrusive and try to be more reasonable in the regulations than the, uh, the current Treasury. One problem we have with the current Treasury, there's virtually nobody there who's actually ever been in the private sector and they have very little understanding of the cost of regulations, how these things are implemented. It also has a disproportionate burden on smaller financial institutions than the bigger ones because the cost of regulation, to some extent a fixed cost, you've got to set up your compliance procedures and all the new software and the stuff is very costly to train your people and all that. But if you're a very large institution, you can, of course, amortize this over many more clients. So actually regulation, financial regulation in general, just not this act, has driven much of the consolidation. People say, oh, they're concerned about these very big financial institutions. Well, it's regulation itself that does that, particularly that like we see it in the United States, because small banks can't afford the burden of regulation. They're forced to combine just because of the increasing cost of compliance. The size and scale of the too big to fails is impressive. Going back to 2007, your Bank of America, your Wells Fargo, your J.P. Morgan, the argument as we came into the crisis in 2008 where these were system critical institutions and they literally were too big to fail. The irony is that by 2011, the end of 2011, those institutions grew at a minimum 24% in terms of assets. Uh, in the case of Wells Fargo, 142 percent. They were too big to fail. <laughs> what are they now? You're right, this is a certain form of insanity. It's driven consolidation. Yep. It's not exactly what we would view as free market capitalism. What might you describe sort of the market, can you call it a mechanism, or what kind of a market do we have today, if not free market capitalism? Well, it is, in certain ways, it, it's almost fascism in that you have state control of privately owned institutions and the managers of these institutions have less and less discretion and people in government have more and more control over them just in how they operate and this of course undermines the whole free market system and uh, we know from past experience other countries around the world for the last 150 years when this stuff has been tried, it's always ended up in failure. And well, in the United States, unless it's all reversed. But the um, Dodd-Frank bill, impossible. Sarbanes-Oxley still hasn't been repealed. That's just caused much of the dry up in IPOs in the US. And so now people who want to do initial public offering go elsewhere in the world. Well, and is it fair to say that the 20s were a period in time uh, where power was consolidated in New York? In the 30s, we saw a migration of that power. The power center became Washington, D.C. We seeing the, the same sort of parallel where you could say the last 15, 20 years even, it's been about New York and banking and finance. And that's, in fact, what we're seeing is a swing back towards governmental control and, and a focus on the power structures in D.C. If there is a similarity, 
Is there anything we can learn from the 30s and 40s, you know, in terms of how we claw ourselves out of that and move back towards free markets? Well, we've got a long history of what doesn't work. And again, with the big regulations in the early 1930s, basically that, the regulations, the tax policy, the spending policy, and the monetary policy at the time kept us in a uh, depressed economic state for more than a decade. It's interesting to note that we had a very sharp recession back in 1907, and which was as sharp a drop as we had after the 2930 crash. But in 1907, the government didn't interfere, and within 18 months, the economy came roaring back and made up for the lost ground because a capitalist system has these automatic correctives within the system. And it's painful for those number of months when you go through what they used to call panics, now we call recessions. But with government coming in there and trying to mitigate it, it usually makes things worse. Look at the housing market. Now we've been in depressed housing for four years. The situation is not getting better. So having all these foreclosures, and the basic problem is the government did not allow housing prices to drop right off to get to their new equilibrium point. And if you're trying to prevent the house price from falling, then you never get to the equilibrium point, and you keep getting people in houses they can't afford. And then if you have an artificially low rate mortgage, then when the mortgage interest payments start to go back up, the person's back in the soup again. Washington tries to insulate people from reality, and of course what it does is de only delays the reality and makes it much worse when it finally comes around. It, it's been suggested that you know, the budget was really not politicized until after World War II, and with the advent of greater voting rights, which we are all in favor of, but with that came the consequence of politicians being much more concerned about where and how the money was spent, the constituency groups that received it, and the budget was, in the context of universal suffrage, completely politicized. You know. Actually, I'm not in favor of expanded voting rights. Our founding fathers understood a fundamental truth. They were basically against democracy. That's why they formed us as a republic, a constitutional republic. And they couldn't figure any other way to do the transitions except for democracy. But democracy was a tool for the Federal Republic. And they deliberately limited the voting franchise at that point to property-owning males. But there was something to be said for, this will sound in this day and age totally politically incorrect, I understand, but for having people who really have a stake in the system. You probably all seen the late night comedians when they do these interviews of people on the street, you know, where you got a high percentage of people who have no idea who the Vice President of the United States is, they have no idea of the three branches of government. Well, this they, Vice President, they might not know because I don't think he's made a public appearance in three and a half years. <laughs> well, they try to keep him locked up, but anyway. Sure. Uh, but uh, the problem is we have large numbers of people who have no idea. It's exactly. not a matter of being left or right, they're mm -hmm. just are totally ignorant when they walk into the voting booth. And it was uh, interesting with the State of the Union address, I commented in my weekly column, and there is a group who measures at what level each State of the Union address is addressed to. And this was at an eighth grade reading level. And that's the lowest since the 1930s. And you can see this dumbing down of government all the time. And as they dumb things down, you tend to get worse and worse policies because people don't understand the consequences. An issue that has concerned me is, again, this attack by the Treasury on foreign banks who happen to have U.S. clients. And, so and the politicians in Washington, people like Carl Levin and other demagogues, they um, get up there and start shouting about people evading their taxes. Well. There are a few people who do that. But the tax loss is minuscule compared to the cost to the economy of all the capital it's driven out, and also the reductions in liberty. And this hypocrisy, this American financial imperialism, 
which we would never tolerate from any other country. And this is extremely destructive. Again, it comes because the, the politicians can pander to people who do not understand the consequences of virtually anything, just a huge government spending. It's as if uh, it comes from a tooth fairy. You got half the adult population that no longer pays taxes, income taxes. And so they, of course, say, well, yeah, let's tax the rich. I'm not paying anything. Let's get this other guy, and I'll get the benefits. Well, as Mark Thatch used to say, you eventually run out of other people's money to spend, and that's the point we're at. And the Swedes, when they were confronted with this problem 15 years ago, they really reversed course, and they have a very flat tax system now, and their tax rates are fairly high, but the, the Swedes are well-educated, and the common person there now understands that if they demand more benefits, they're going to be paying for it. It's not going to be the person down the block. And that's healthy for a democracy. People have to understand that they can't shift burdens to uh, former uh, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, Russell Long, used to say, the fellow behind a tree. Yeah, though well, that's interesting because while their tax rate is, is incredibly high, everyone gets to participate. And, and that, that mm -hmm. is maybe the difference because your concern, if we can put it in those words, over what was intended to be a constitutional republic and has become a democracy or, or some form of mob rule is, is that you really have people voting their self-interest. Yeah. And it, with no skin in the game, nothing to lose, everything to gain, it, it's actually pretty predictable what the course that human nature will take you on. Yeah. Virtually all democracies have failed because of this. And there was a great line from Thomas Jefferson, and he said, when the people realize they can vote themselves benefits, all is lost. It seems like we wouldn't or shouldn't have learned from history in that regard. And I realize this comes back to the issue of you've got way too many people who just don't get it. They haven't gotten the education they needed. They don't have the perspective necessary to give a real input at the polls. What we look forward to in, in, in 2013, 14, 15, 16 is, e is either a new administration or the same administration. What's your advice in terms of how the average citizen who does care what should they be doing? I mean, it, so there's there's room to be a critic. I would I would not yeah. say you know an armchair critic. Oh, this is just a problem with the world. It's going to hell in the handbasket. But there's a lot of people out there who want to know how can we make a difference. We love this country. Yeah. Well, it's part a great of it, opportunity it, to live here. Yeah. Privilege is getting involved, educating oneself, and then also making efforts to educate others. Those at the Cato Institute and the other think tanks is one thing we try to do. I spend a great deal of time, you know, writing, lecturing, doing radio and TV, and hopefully bringing some increased level of understanding of how these things operate. And you do have a lot of, particularly young people, we look to Ron Paul supporters and others, it's very interesting to see how many people who don't have the immediate self-interest but do understand the longer-term self-interest are beginning to catch on here. We cannot continue this particular course because it is in the process of ruining the country, and it will, but if we don't make the changes. Now, you can be an optimist and say, well, Canada and Sweden reverse course. Greece didn't. A number of other course, uh, countries haven't. You know, uh, Argentina is an example. Keeps smashing into the wall. Is it fair to extrapolate from those examples and say, if we don't reverse course, then it, the, the outcome is fairly predictable? Yeah. Well, let's, let's take Argentina. A hundred years ago, it had the fourth highest per capita income in the world. Fourth. Not third, but fourth. It could be third, yeah. but I think it was fourth. Okay. As well as they can measure back then. Yeah. But it had an extremely high standard of living. And now it's something like 78. Wow. You see other countries which have gone steadily downhill. Sweden is very interesting, where it had grown rapidly from 1870 to 1970 and had reached in the top three or four uh, levels of per capita income. And then, because they allowed their welfare state to grow, they nationalized a number of industries. Economic growth plummeted, unemployment went up, debt rose, and the Swedes saw they were on a disastrous course. And by 1995, both the parties of the left and right basically came together and said, this isn't working. 
And so we all think of uh, Sweden as this great socialist welfare state, but actually they have a voucher system now for schools. Every parent's given a voucher so that you can pick your own public or private school. So there's competition and education. They've gone to the Chilean uh, model for pensions, which is a defined contribution like a 401k rather than defined benefit. 30 countries have adopted that. So we do have examples from around the world where countries have reverse course before they went off the cliff. But the U.S., we're getting very, very close now. And um, we're down to talking about months, no longer years. Back in 1982 and 83, I was on the Social Security Advisory Council, the Quadrato Commission, that was appointed by President Reagan. And those years, we were dealing particularly with Medicare. And we're trying to make some changes. It was clear that we had roughly 20 years, maybe 30 years before you hit the wall with Medicare. Well, this was almost 30 years ago, and we've now hit the wall. <laughs> and because we didn't do the changes that each of the quadrennial commissions has made the recommendations, the one I was on and subsequent ones, and the politicians have ignored the reality, and now we have the mess. Eyes wide shut is basically the, the, the status quo in, in yeah. D.C. Yeah. I mean, it's still, it's amazing the denial you still have. And when Paul Ryan came out with his budget, he's chairman of the House Budget Committee, extremely bright guy, very good economist, full of integrity. He came out with a budget it could work. And so all these people applauded him for his great courage, and it did pass the House. But it absolutely died in the Senate. You know, the Senate Democrat leaders wouldn't even bring it up for a vote. They didn't come up with an alternative. But it was just, I mean, what Harry Reid did, I look, is a, just an abdication of a basic responsibility. And you could say, well, I disagree with Paul Ryan on this or that, and come up with an alternative. They did nothing. And that's not how the system is supposed to function. If the system were to function in a healthy way, and we're talking about the, the structure of our government, it would still need good people. We're in too deep. A generation or two needs to go by, and, and in the context of crisis, perhaps there's the right people that are, that are born out of that. Or could we scratch around and find something other than you know a law professor at the University of Illinois? What kind of leadership would actually set us on a decent course and perhaps reverse the Reed tendencies, if you will. In, in There's government. a lot of good people actually up there in Congress, particularly in the House. You have people like Paul Ryan, and there's a number of others who are smart, trying to do the right thing. I'm old enough to remember the Carter administration when we had double-digit inflation, a 21% prime rate. And then, fortunately, Ronald Reagan came along and a number of good members with him, and we were able to reverse course. I mean, we saw the same thing happen in, in Britain at the same time. Margaret Thatcher was elected the year beforehand because Britain was going down the tube. And I still remember when she was up for her first re-election, I think it was 1983, I was in London, and I had gotten in a taxi cab to go out to Heathrow to fly back to the U.S. And I um, asked the, the taxi cab driver his opinion of Mrs. Thatcher. And he said, oh, I don't like her. Um, I come from a labor family, always been labor, and uh, I said, well, you're voting against her then, aren't you? He said, no, I'm voting for her. And I said, I thought you just told me you didn't like her. He said, I don't, but Britain needs her. And I thought that was the wisdom of the common man. You know, if things have to get bad enough, we saw that happen in the U.S. in 1980. The media tried to portray Ronald Reagan as some kind of madman who was going to start a nuclear war and do all kinds of things, of course. It was nothing of the kind, but um, people walk up and said they can't continue this. And uh, I hope this happens again before change. And you never sort of know beforehand who will emerge. I mean, it's who's going to be a stand-up person. Uh, we've been lucky as a country, the right person at the right time. Britain's been particularly lucky. I mean, begin of World War II, Winston Churchill had been out in disgrace and everything, but people suddenly realized he had some of the qualities they needed, an incredible background and the smarts, and he would do what needed to be done. And he did. There's this perception, I think, amongst many U.S. investors that 
the dollar is doomed, the treasury market is doomed, the U.S. is doomed, the best thing that you can do is jump ship as fast as you can, relocate to Ecuador, Panama, South America, Ireland, Singapore. I mean, anywhere is better but the United States. Now, I'll be honest, I travel a lot out of the United States, mm -hmm. and I come home, and every time I come home, other than the TSA, <laughs> <laughs> I still like coming home. It still represents a bastion of many, many, th I mean, I can make a laundry yeah. list of the things that set it apart and make it better than wherever I've just come from, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's Asia, whether it's South yeah. America, Central America. What's your response to the, the dollar is doomed, the Treasury is doomed, the U.S. is doomed, throw in the towel? Well, if I thought all that, then I wouldn't be doing what I do. I mean, every week I sit down and write a column and then do some other columns. I find a little place to hide out in and do nothing, but uh, I prefer to stay here and fight and it, try to change things. And it, if I thought it was totally hopeless, I wouldn't bother. Is it fair to say that to the degree that you do throw in the towel, and I'm not saying you, but just anyone, mm -hmm. to the degree that someone throws in the towel, there's a certain degree of culpability for this inevitable demise, quote-unquote. Yeah. I mean, it's... You didn't what, do anything to stop it, yeah, so you bore some of the blame. We, indeed, are masters of our destiny, collectively, anyway. Mm -hmm. My family goes a long way back in the United States. I've had ancestors who fought in the American Revolution. And at that point, they really risk everything. They were going to be dead if they didn't win. And our struggles are uh, much Not less... Not quite that extreme. Yeah, much less severe. But I think if the average citizen did say, I've pledged my life, my fortune, my sacred honor, um, and set aside party politics, not unlike the taxi driver in Britain who said, I don't like her, but the country needs her, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be interesting? I mean, it's a different perspective when you can look at your preferences and yeah, say, my preferences well, don't matter. Yeah. Well, I think it gets to a point, at least I, I hope so, and I use that taxi cab illustration, that when people say, we cannot continue on this way, and the pain gets increasingly great. We saw that in the late 1970s, what we used to call the misery index, the combination of inflation and unemployment got sky high, and people were hurting day in and day out. The fact is, people are not hurting as much now. Unemployment's high, but inflation hasn't been, but this is all going to come and people will find that they're not having their improvement in their lives. Per capita, real per capita incomes have not risen in four years. And we've not had such a period in the United States since the end of World War II. At some point, people are gonna say, enough is enough is enough, and we're gonna to have to make the changes, even if they're painful. The statistic that I've seen is that in the year of election, if a political party has not coincidentally seen an increase in the national income of 3.2 percent, that party's out. So it doesn't matter what party it is, but it's, it's essentially if people aren't doing better, and it's a very short time frame, but yeah. not doing better in the year that they get to vote and say, I don't like this, then the party's done. On the one hand, the statistics are implying that whoever takes the Republican nomination as a shoe in by default, the people aren't happy, we're not seeing an, an increase in, in income. And the, the issue also is that unemployment remains stubbornly high. 7.4% is the t statistic often used. If unemployment is above 7.4%, the incumbent's done, out. If it's below, then they're likely to remain. There is this opportunity on the part of the Republican Party. Is the RNC engaged with this? Is the RNC going to do anything other than sort of stand by and, and, and watch the, the suicides between you know the contenders today? Will they do anything? Tell well, me there's a plan here. Well, I don't know. I mean, I I used to be involved much more heavily in politics than I am now. You know, you get disappointed. I, I worked for both President Reagan and particularly the first President Bush. And um, But since those days, I decided just to work on policies rather than particular candidates. I found that if you can convince people of the correctness of a policy, that the politicians will come along. And trying to convince the politician the correctness of the policy, if, he, if the constituent hasn't been convinced, doesn't do you a whole lot of good. I 
focus my time and energy working with think tanks and other groups who are trying to educate people in terms of proper policy. Well, that says that grassroots efforts are, are far more important than, than the person in power. Yeah. Which speaks to that issue of no one should be throwing in the towel. Everyone should be deeply involved. You know, maybe it's extreme to say you know, you're culpable if you have thrown in the towel. But, but the reality is if it's not a leader, if it's us directing a leader and them basically taking their finger to the wind and saying, oh, the people really do care about that issue, mm -hmm. that just means that we have to make our yeah. voice heard. Most politicians, if they see that people really want less spending or lower taxes, will go that way. And there's a few who will both go against their constituencies and do the wrong things, and you've got a few of them who will go against the constituencies to do the right thing. But they're, they're a rare breed. A rare breed indeed. Ronald Reagan, to me, thinking back on it, and I always liked him, but I didn't fully appreciate how good he was until years after. But one thing he used to say, people would, would say well, he repeated the same thing over and he was repetitive with it, but he'd been a radio announcer selling, you know, some kind of product at one point in his life. And he said he learned that first you've got to tell people what you're going to tell them. Then you have to tell them. Then you've got to tell them what you told them. And then you have to do it time and time again. And it was an education, never-ending educational job to get people to understand. And then people got it. And then he was able to get, you know, those two landslides bring along a good number of members of Congress to get the fundamental changes. I, but I, also, he, he focused very much. And one problem with um, Newt Gingrich, and I have known Newt for 30 years, is he's not focused. And Reagan, he had two basic things, rebuild the U.S. economy and win the Cold War. Those were two big ideas, as Newt would say, but Reagan didn't try to go on with 32 big ideas. That's one reason he succeeded, because people could understand it. You know, another problem we have with the huge growth of regulations, I read the other day, now we have more than 4,000 felonies in the United States of things you can do, which is a felony. Well, the average person can't remember the Ten Commandments, let alone 4,000 things they could go to jail for. And it's not only keeping government small, but also keeping it simple so people understand what the basic rules are. You don't need that many rules. You know, if you say no person has a right to interfere with anybody else's person or property or engage in uh, misrepresentation or theft or fraud, that pretty well covers everything you need to know. It sounds like we should return to the copybook headings. Yeah. If you remember the, the, yeah. the simple poem. Yeah. Well, next year we look forward to sort of an update and, you know, whether it's FATCA being implemented or perhaps being repealed and other developments inside D.C., we look forward to your input. Thanks well, for joining us Let's hope it's, it's, it's buried deep into the ground where it belongs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney and Richard Ron from the Bahamas. Uh, join us next week at McIlvaney.com. That's M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. Or give us a call if you have questions at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.